you know, we think about it not just being a sort of AV experience, but also a tactile one, being able to provide people with like the rope so that when you look within the headset, you see the rope bridge. When you reach out, you actually feel rope. You feel the ground shaking when the avalanche is happening. They've got that rock wall. Um, so all of these things, you know, to capitalize on more senses as you're going through this is really sort of the, the strength of, a, of an installation. Well, hello and welcome to Mobile Content and Storytelling. Um, there's been some great content today um, and more to come about how to create and tell pictures, uh, create pictures for the big screen, including uh, drones that can shoot pictures from the sky. This panel is about um, how you tell those stories and how you produce for the small screen mobile devices and um, the challenges and opportunities presented by um, skinning down your experience to work um, not only in, in, in on those devices, but um, across multiple platforms. And uh, uh, my, name, my name is Steve Kern. I'm executive creative director of, of Comedy Partners. We're um, located here in the South End. Uh, my company has always been in the area of branded content and games, application development, um, and increasingly, increasingly getting into app development, VR, and AR. Um, we have today with us a very talented creative pan panel of producers, including um, Mike Rubenstein, VP of Integrated Operations at Hill Holiday. Lauren Prestilio, series producer for American Experience. Athena Peters, executive producer of Turbine Games. And Ben Jones, creative director for Art, Copy, and Code Google. Um, I thought I'd start by letting each of these people, um, uh, maybe starting down on the end with Mike, um, just, just give kind of a drone level overview of, of who you are and what you do. and, and uh, um, you know, see how you approach this. Where, you, where are you reaching audiences with, with stories? Sure. Uh, so I'm Mike Rubenstein. I'm from Hill Holiday. Uh, so within the production department that I fall under, we're sort of in, you know, my sort of core group. We're in the group that's really handling a lot of the um, more sort of tech-based experiential work. So while the bulk of the work that, you know, my department is doing is primarily broadcast-oriented, we're doing a lot more of the sort of the physical manifestations of a lot of these ideas. So when you know we want to do something that uh, is either going to be an installation of some sort, a road show, um, really anything that sort of has a physical presence, that's tr primarily the kind of stuff that we do. And then so far as my background goes, when there is a more tech component to that, that's usually when I'm sort of more heavily involved. So with regards to this space, so far as how we're talking about mobile, I mean, with everything that we do, we're really looking at that not only as sort of you know, a potential implementation with regards to is there an app, is there a web app, is there some sort of, you know, mobile-centric activity that you need to do. But more often than not, we're really looking at the landscape in general and saying how are people communicating and how do how is what we're going to be doing going to be talked about in that space. So how are people really going to capture what we're doing in a way that translates well to, you know, a smaller screen, to a screen at all. So if we've got sort of a, a large, you know, sort of, grand view of what it is you we want you to see, sort of this big thing that we've built. What, how are people really going to you know, take pictures of that, talk about it? Does it translate outside of the physical experience, knowing that the bulk of our audience won't see these things in person? So I think you know, we're, we're predominantly preoccupied with mobile in the sense of you know, this is how people talk to each other, and we want them talking about us. Is what we're doing really going to read well in that space? And how do we you know, curate and cater to that as much as we can? Yeah, just right down the line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lauren Priscillo. I'm a series producer for American Experience, which is PBS's history series, which is produced right here at WGBH. So it's nice to see so many people who don't work at WGBH here today. <laughs> um, welcome. Um, but, you know, probably of everyone up here, I come from the most traditional media background. You know, our core business at American Experience is producing feature length historical documentaries primarily for television or um, theatrical release. So, you know, that core business to a great extent is 27 years old. That's how long American Experience has been on PBS. And that core business is likely to remain relatively the same. You know, these are one hour, two hour, in some cases four or six hour documentaries. And so the challenge for us is not 
how do we think platform first as far as our core content of what we're doing? It's how do we take that content, how do we you know, splice it up? How do we make it available in on those different platforms? You know, we're thinking of everything from somebody sitting in a theater and watching the full film down to someone on Facebook looking at their feed. How do they sample our content and our brand in a way that is consistent with our brand so we don't want to deviate so far from it that if people were then to come get to know us on PBS that they feel like these are two completely different entities. But keeping in mind the different audiences both on mobile platforms and any other digital platforms versus people who are sitting down in their living rooms on a Tuesday night to watch one of our films. So we're looking at you know both how do we slice and dice our core content and then what additional content do we produce that is in line with our brand and with our content that we can put out there that we are thinking more specifically platform first and increasingly we obviously have to be thinking in that way in order to remain relevant and to be bringing in a new audience because you know as our audience ages and eventually disappears we need to be replacing them we need to be replacing them consistently with younger with younger viewers Goes to that big theater in the sky <laughs> exactly. exactly so it's kind of how do you take something that is traditional and is 27 years old and yeah. make it relevant to new audiences on these platforms hi I'm Athena Peters executive producer at turbine uh, my project is Lord of the Rings online um, which I produce a massive multiplayer online game. Um, that is actually the space in which my entire career has been in. Um, so for me, I entered the games industry um, for the connected audience experience, that idea of all of these people from around the world connecting in this space and forming friendships and connections that they may not have been going on adventures that they may not have been able to do in real life. Um, so for me, like right now, Turbine is looking forward towards um, moving into the mobile space in our game development. Um, and so a lot of my time when not focused specifically on the, the product that I'm working on um, and making that better in the PC space it's in is thinking about how do we continue this interacted, you know, interactive, connected environment on, on the mobile platforms. So it's just super excited because actually it's a huge boost for us um, because we can remove that need to, to sit down at a desk in front of this large piece of equipment and wait for download speeds and all of that. Now it's right here in the pocket, right? So you can be connected to all of those, you know, millions of friends that you have. Um, go run around in some, you know, fantasy space just by pulling your phone out of your pocket, um, which is which is super exciting. So. Um, for us, it's about not only finding that, right, and doing the standalone games there, um, but connecting that into the larger brands, um, you know, of the, we work under WB uh, Games header, so connecting those, you know, great IPs that we have to work with across multiple platforms, right, supporting across movies and TV shows and the games, um, as well as, you know, finding other ways to make games interesting on these new devices that we can just have on our bodies. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it's about here. Awesome. I'm Ben. I'm from Google. I work with a team called Art, Copy, and Code. Our job is to figure out what advertising is going to be in five years uh, by doing projects now, sort of in the next three to six months. And for us, you know, mobile is a set of behaviors. It's a distribution mechanism. It's a device, hardware, software, context. All those, all, all those things are knit up together. Um, and I think you know, even at Google. We're buying companies as fast as we can. We can't keep up with mobile. Uh, so I think it's fascinating to see both how rapidly the market is changing and then how rapidly behaviors are changing uh, on top of that. I was shocked to learn the other day that more people are watching video content on YouTube on mobile devices in the US than on any cable channel. Any cable channel, wow. just on mobile. So. Um, we were sitting around in the office, as we all are, we were debating, I think it was a, a, a car commercial, uh, and it opened with this long, slow tracking shot, beautiful tracking shot of Pacific Coast Highway, and, you know, the, the kids in my office were like, oh, skip, like, skip, no one's going to watch skip. <laughs> and so we had the debate that you all have, we all have, you know, oh, would we skip it? Is it beautiful? Do we want to know? How does the story unfold? How does that change in mobile? And so we started to do a series of experiments. The first one um, we called Portrait versus Landscape. It was not about orientation. 
we had a, a minute of a guy sitting, a guy on our team, a perfectly good looking guy, but relatively ordinary, drinking a cup of coffee, just looking right at the camera, and then a minute out the, out the window of our designer's apartment, just to say, like, will we pay attention to a face longer or uh, landscape longer, portrait versus landscape? Uh, and we ran it on desktop and mobile. Um, and I, I think unsurprisingly, we'll pay attention to a face longer and proportionally longer on mobile. Uh, that was not surprising. What was surprising was we got a view through rate, that is the number of people who didn't skip, that was unbelievably high, uh, higher than great Super Bowl commercials. And it was just a guy, he was sitting there, there was no music, there was no story, he was just <laughs> looking at the camera. I think I found my Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, there it is. And so we, that was, we, we said there's something going on here that we don't understand, right? So we did a series of, uh, of these sort of experiments just with people in our office, and it grew up into this initiative which we call Unskippable Labs, which is experiments and content so we can understand the uh, future of storytelling. What does it mean, what is happening, especially what's happening uh, in mobile. So we did a branded experiment with Mountain Dew. We got a little film of the, of the first experiment. Uh, and I think the most surprising thing, we've done four or five of these now, this is the first public one, uh, is that we really don't have any idea. Uh, it's different than we think. It's longer than we think. Um, the experience of it is different than we think. Yeah, if we could start at 110. Yep. When I was like six years old, you know, there were three networks and a few local stations. Something would be on channel two and then you didn't like that commercial. And then you go to channel four, same commercial, same commercial, same commercial, same commercial. So you're going to get it whether you want it or not. Well, today, you don't have to get anything you don't want to get. So that means you have to want to look at it. Simply taking a TV ad and putting it into a mobile device, the analogy is sort of like taking a Picasso and trying to stick it into a dollhouse. You know, you've got to give it a deeper thought. And it's kind of a no-brainer for brands to just go, throw our ad that was on TV and just throw it on digital, mobile, you know, TrueView. That may be what they want to see. We weren't sure. So he took one video, cut three versions, and measured to see what people would watch. We started with an idea that we knew had uh, all these legs to live in multiple channels. Hey, pass me a kickstart. The choices we made in Edit One was basically taking our 30 and putting it on TrueView. What we were noticing is that a lot of brands on TrueView were throwing their product in the first five seconds. For them, it was a way of like, well, if they're gonna skip out my ad, at least they'll see my brand. So we wanted to create a long form, kind of intriguing, doesn't feel like an ad, doesn't look like an ad, um, and it's just pure fun. With mobile, it's always kind of ingrained in your head that you have to be quick. So my predictions were they were probably gonna drop out sooner. But they didn't. The view through on desktop was pretty much the same for all three cuts. But something strange happened on mobile. People watched more of the third cut on mobile than anywhere else. People who chose to watch, watched for much longer. Maybe mobile is not about being quicker, but simply better. To come out and, and, and say, yes, they're willing to engage longer on mobile. I think that's the big key takeaway. Millennials and Gen Z, they love brands. They just don't like being sold to. Viewers of the third cut didn't recall having seen an ad, but they still remembered the brand. The lift was the same across all three versions. We noticed that on all three, the, the brand awareness was pretty much equal. That's a better way of measuring success. It's less about, yes, yes, I saw an ad. It was more about, yes, I saw the brand. In terms of what we hope to learn from the mobile recut, it's just what really resonates, what really engages most effectively through mobile. It's zero sum every day. There's new things always happening. Consumers are trying new things. We didn't know. I didn't like calling them consumers. That's a terrible word, people. People are doing new things, discovering new things, engaging with brands as they never did. So we're already learning a lot, but there's a lot more we can learn, and that's why this whole thing is so exciting. You've always had to tell a great truth and a great story about a brand. It's not a nice to have, it's a must. Great. 
All right. Yeah. So you can cut around that. You can cut around all my mistakes. <laughs> So the most important uh, question I have, Ben, your bio says that you provided the voice of the Affleck duck in social media. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I think that needs a, a deeper explanation. <laughs> the, the duck only says Affleck. Only, it only says Affleck in every commercial for however 25 years. And uh, we had just won the Affleck account, and I was responsible for being the duck in social media. This is a, this, you couldn't just post Affleck every single day, Twitter, Facebook, you know, it just couldn't be what it was. And so we had to figure out what the voice of the Affleck duck, I did not actually speak as the voice I was. So it's a literary <laughs> voice of. You cannot, you cannot imagine the amount of internal consternation there was over the duck's taste in music. <laughs> <laughs> Enormous. <laughs> Enormous. Um, so this question is for Lauren. Um, how quickly and dramatically has mobile, uh, mobile and viewing on multiple screens shaped the demand for new content? Well, like I said, we come from, I come from a more traditional background. So I think what, where we come at that is how quickly can we make our content available on that on those platforms you know what's interesting in in what ben was saying and where i think the connection is to our work is that do people want things really fast and really short, or do they want a really, really good story? And that's where we come at it with American Experience. You know, at the very heart of our brand is very good storytelling. And so the question is, will people come to those stories across multiple platforms, and will they stay with that story, regardless of which platform they're on? And so we produce our core content kind of platform agnostic. You know, people are watching it. We know people are watching um, on television, in theaters. In the case of Last Days in Vietnam, that's a film that we released theatrically. So people saw this everywhere from sitting in a dark movie theater, literally with the popcorn, the soda, all of that, to watching it um, on their televisions. We did a three-day stunt where we did a three-day digital release of the film prior to its television premiere. And then after it did premiere on television, um, the cumulative ratings and where people were consuming it was vastly different from where we had been seeing that even three months, six months before. And I think that's even changed again. You know, We just released a four-hour biography, which of Walt Disney, which I know to a lot of you up here, the idea of four hours is like asking <laughs> someone to sit down and read War and Peace. But what we saw, even from Last Days in Vietnam, which released last April to now, is that shift in where people are viewing it is so much bigger. Um, and also the demand to be publishing additional related content to that is so much higher. So with Walt Disney, which just aired a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a much higher demand on us to be releasing a lot of short content. And whether that was direct lifts from the film that we were releasing on in um, social media, on social media platforms, or whether those were things that we were picking up from the cutting room floor, that was certainly a much higher demand on us now than it ever has been before because we need to bring people into this content and bring them in that is in a way that isn't asking them for four hours of their time, at least initially. You, you feel like that's something that people have gotten better at? I know that, that years past, I used, I used to hear complaints from television producers that uh, we, we have this mandate to do all this extra stuff. But um, obviously, the way you're approaching things, it's much more integrated. It's a much more. Um, thoughtful approach to, to, to making these assets part of the story? I think people have gotten better at it. I, of course, we work across, we work with a lot of different producers, and certainly some of them are much more tuned into that. You know, a lot of them along the way will say, hey, you know, we dropped this piece out of the film. You guys should be thinking about this to release digitally. Um, other filmmakers, just that is not how they're thinking. You know, they think in terms of 60 minutes, 90 minutes. You know, they're not thinking in terms of, wow, there was a really great 60 seconds that I think would be very sticky online or someone would right. completely watch that <laughs> on, on a mobile device. But we do luckily have a lot of producers who are doing that. And over the course of the past few years, just our digital teams and our marketing teams have become so much more integrated into that process. I, I think that's something that is very different that 
with our film producers now, we have our digital team and our marketing teams talking with them before they even shoot their first interviews. So they appreciate the fact that that content has to live across multiple platforms and in a lot of different places. So to the extent that it is driving us to produce something very different and very new, not necessarily to the extent that we're paying attention to how we're going to be distributing it and what pieces of that content we should be we should be thinking about that would work on those platforms. Absolutely, that's changed very quickly. It's, it's interesting when we started to do this research, we looked at the last uh, 50 years of Hollywood movies and found that they're not getting shorter, they're actually getting longer, but the shot length is decreasing drastically. So we want the pace to be quicker, but we don't actually want them to be any shorter. And I think for those of us who binge watch TV, um, you know, that's not surprising. Like we're happy to spend 30 hours on a weekend with Mad Men or the entirety <laughs> of House of Cards. It isn't that we want less, it's just that we want what we want. Tina, yeah. Yeah. do you find a similar um, challenge that um, when you're, you're creating, um, you know, we talked about the fact that you're creating the main game, but yeah. you have all these other platforms to consider. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, were they an afterthought, and 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 now are they a much more important part of the process and the no, rollout it was, of the game? It was definitely like I can recall a few years back when when the only thing we had to worry about was getting players in the game, and then uh, you know maybe we'd have we'd have some forums right for them to discuss what's going on inside the world. Um, you know now we have like our community teams have to be managing not only our forums but you know our Twitter presence and our Facebook presence and. So we're putting up content, bits of content, to get people engaged there and remind them to come back to us right, on a regular basis. And then on top of that, we're doing things like you know, Twitch streaming. Right? We're actually streaming other people playing the game, which is always fascinating to me. Like I'm a, As a game player, I'd rather go spend my time playing games. But there's actually this huge audience of people who love to watch other people play games. Um, through like things like, like Twitch, which is uh, fascinating to me. So it's another thing that we have, you know, that we're we support, right? So we have a couple. There's a couple of people on my team who will spend like you know an hour a week running through the, you know, running through the game with microphone headsets on and and you know basically airing this as additional content on top of what we're doing already. Um, but definitely on the point of uh, you know what a couple other folks have said here, I think the quality is the big thing. Um, about going into the mobile space. I know that as we've been moving into mobile space, a lot of like even like, you know, developers who are used to working in the PC and the console um, environment um, got very scared about moving into the mobile space because the initial mobile releases on the game space anyway were these just like little pixel things and they, they were very basic and they weren't necessarily high quality games that you wanted to spend hours of your time in. Um, but as we've moved into that, more and more developers have gotten into this space. People who have spent years developing games and really understand game theory to begin with um, have gotten into that space. Now we have this ability to make these really high quality you know, experiences on these, these smaller devices. And so I think it's just uh, what we've discovered is that it wasn't a matter of you know, people just wanting to pull out of their pocket and, and tap on something for a couple minutes and then put it away. And that was the extent at which game developers had on uh, the mobile platform. But that players actually do want that fully immersive, rich, great art. Um, and as the technology develops, right, and gets better, and, and these phones are as fast as some of our PCs, right, right we, can, we actually have the ability to do that and give them that high quality, you know, experience that they want. I mean, I find I'll spend, you know, I'll spend a couple of hours playing certain games on my tablet um, because they're high quality, great um, entertainment pieces. Yeah. Um, so that's not a problem at all. Um, I think it's really a matter of like giving players that that quality experience, exactly what they're wanting to play, what they're you know you wanting to do, and then for us, it's a matter of interruptible, right? Determining whether or not like your play chunks need to be segmented out. I think a lot like um, even in the production of the movies, you were talking about taking that four-hour movie and then determining where the cut points are. Right. That if you needed to chunk it down, you could. We, we encounter the same thing, right? So it's a matter of if I need to interrupt my game space, I know I'm only committing to five to 15 minutes, but I could sit here and play for two or three hours if I wanted to, right? If, I was, if there wasn't a kid coming right. up and <laughs> maybe turn it off. So there's so, many, there's so much overlap between um, 
these very different practice areas, but one of the things that we all have in common is, is having to stay ahead of where things are headed. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of buzz this year, and I'm certain there's a lot of buzz at this conference about things like uh, virtual reality and Oculus Rift and augmented reality. And uh, Mike, you had an interesting opportunity to work with that technology. I'd love to hear more about that and maybe see an example of what you guys did there. Sure, yeah, I think, you know, we, to the best that we can, you know, as an agency, have tried our best to you know stay up up to date with that, explore the opportunities that are there. We had a great one come through uh, throughout last year that finally launched at uh, Sundance this year uh, for Merrill. They had a new hiking boot that was coming out where, and they they essentially wanted to be talked about. You know, they really just wanted to be back on the map. You know, identity wise more than anything. You know, they they were the boring brown boots that you wear forever and. You know, very similar to sort of the, the aging demographics we were talking about earlier, they've had the same customers for a very long time. So they, you know, were just looking for a way to talk about themselves differently, have other people talk about them differently, and just do something that celebrated the outdoors, but in a way that was still a little more close to where our sort of cultural sensibilities were in places where people are talking about it. Um, you know, like I was saying before, like, we look at mobile as such a heavy communication method, but you know, what are we really talking about there for a brand like that? And so we had done this, um, you know, uh, essentially a, a pretty sizable virtual reality installation wherein we, at the core of it, really wanted to make sure that we think of VR as sort of the headset, the headphones, you're sitting, you're standing, but you're just sort of watching something happen. But, you know, with a brand with activity and the outdoors at its core, how could we make that a more sort of physical experience? Um, so I, I think if we want to play this, it probably explains it better. Merrill is launching their newest, most advanced hiking shoe, the Capra. So how do we show people the extreme places this new killer shoe can take them in a new and exciting way? By taking over the Sundance Film Festival with the very first Oculus Rift virtual reality experience that uses motion capture technology, so the user is able to walk around in a virtual world. Welcome to the Dolomite. Once that mist clears, head down the bridge. There we are. It's a virtual reality experience with a difference. So uh, we've done quite a few virtual reality experiences before, but we've never had a client brave enough to do a walk around one. Make sure you stop at the end and take in the view. What you'll be doing is taking a virtual hike in the Dolomites in Italy, and you'll be going across a particularly wobbly rope bridge. Whoa. And then there might be some sort of landslide. And then you might need to find your way to the summit of a mountain. How am I scared in a little hallway and yet it's unbelievable. It was wild, man. It was wild. So it's a, it's a virtual reality headset like there are many out there already, but the difference being this time is that we're using a motion capture system. So there's an OptiTrack motion capture system in the entire space. So not only do you have the ability to look around at whatever you like, you can also be tracked in that space. So wherever you go, we can simulate your view inside our technology. That was awesome. It was really cool. 4D elements like the bridge, wind, and the ground shaking made the experience feel even more lifelike. People were amazed. That's yeah, crazy. we're way cooler than I was expecting. It was the most amazing thing ever. Terrified. I'm still walking like this. Literally felt like I was like. That's, that's pretty intense. But actually moving through that space. It's just, there's no other feeling like it. Speechless. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Holy cow. And most importantly, it made them want to get outside and do it for real. There, guys. Thanks. So, I mean, you can argue the effectiveness of really, like, you know, is it really inspiring people to get outdoors? We hope so. But, you know, what, <laughs> was it really cool? It really was. Like, it was a tremendous uh, sort of jump for us. You know, Ben was talking about earlier, you know, in needing to sort of look at where are things going to be in five years and, you know, trying to aim for that now. With the speed at which VR has been progressing, particularly over the last year and a half or so, we had to not only look at what we could do there, but what would people be doing by the time we could actually launch this, which for a project like this, we're looking at a, a runway of, you know, sometimes 10 months or so. So, you know, 
we had to sort of think about what's not only possible and what are people already experiencing and what are they going to like, but also where are we going with that and what's, what do we predict as being the next step and how can we aim for that instead. So, you know, the, the physical motion is a huge, huge component of this one, but also, you know, when we think about it not just being a sort of AV experience, but also a tactile one, being able to provide people with like the rope so that when you look within the headset, you see the rope bridge. When you reach out, you actually feel rope. You feel the ground shaking when the avalanche is happening. We've got that rock wall. Um, so all of these things, you know, to capitalize on more senses as you're going through this is really sort of the, the strength of, a, of an installation like this. So It's fascinating to me that this is taking place at Sundance because, you know, we have a completely different product, which is this feature length film that we're also premiering at Sundance. You know, that Last Days in Vietnam, that premiered at Sundance and you couldn't in some ways be further apart from those two worlds as far as producing virtual reality. But when you go to a place like Sundance, you see that convergence of this idea that people want things that are experiential, that are immersive, and people are drawn to the storytelling. So whether that storytelling has to do with a brand, a pair of shoes, or whether it has to do with something that took place in 1975 in Vietnam and they can settle into a dark theater and kind of just have this immersive experience because it's on a giant screen in front of them. And when you go to festivals like that, whether it's Sundance or South By or anything like that, you realize that that's where brands are going to, you know, that, and all of this has to do with kind of feeling connected to a story and connected to a product. So do you feel that that's on your radar? For us? Yeah, VR and is there something that you have to stay <laughs> on top of? And <laughs> I think to some extent, you know, our colleagues at Frontline actually were just, just announced that they were launching uh, virtual reality, how that um, connects with journalism, which I think is really interesting. They were doing something in um, related to Ebola that were putting people kind of on the ground in these Ebola affected areas, and which I think is, is amazing. I haven't experienced it yet, but I think that's great. And we've talked about that in the history space. You know, in some ways, when you have traditional filmmakers, the idea of that, they would be a little bit allergic to it. But actually, you know, in conversations with our executive producer, there are certain things from history that if you could imagine actually being there and seeing how that felt rather yeah, than there's a level of empathy watching it on screen I think would would be it. fascinating you know we yeah. talked about that we have so many films that explore the civil rights movement what if you were physically in a space where that you were experiencing that you know where you weren't seeing it in black and white photos and I think that's the other thing with history that is fascinating when there are so many before a certain time period it's black and white what if we could put someone in a full color reality where they were experiencing that yeah, history and what that cool. felt like? That would be very cool. Well, I think so are we doing there's... it right now? No. <laughs> Should we be at some point? Yes. I think there's also, I mean, there's an interesting opportunity there to, for different types of storytelling wherein, you know, something like this, for example, I mean, is incredibly story light, but where we sort of go lighter on sort of a narrative, we're thinking more about an you know, exploratory experience. So. Yeah part of what you're doing with something where you've got the freedom to move around wherever you want, look at whatever you want, and go through at your own speed. This could have been a 10 minute thing, this could have been a two minute thing, but you have the, you know, the ability to make it what you want it to be and really make you know, any sort of explorations you like within the environment that we give you. So I think when you think about just you know, exploring a place and just sort of feeling what it's like to be there, rather than just saying, here is how the director has guided you through and this is the story they want to tell. You, you've got a little more wiggle room to really let people tell their own stories if they've got the ability to see as much as you can let them see. Athena, what about in the game world? Um, it's definitely something that uh, you know is on our radar and something that we're looking into. I think there's still a little bit of technology hurdles in that, right? Even in creating game space like that. What we just watched was a very controlled environment. Um, right, but there's still some um, things about movement and you know things happening in the screen space that you're looking at that can still like majorly mess with you know yeah. make you very motion sick, um, that kind of stuff. 
that we have to be more wary of just because our experiences tend to be um, longer. But it's something that we're watching. It's something we're aware of. Uh, I've, you know, I have an artist on my team who would be super excited to let people just take a VR like fly through of Tolkien's world. And, right. You know, and I think many of us would be really excited about doing that, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's definitely something that we that we're watching and that we're very excited about and and tracking. Because, um, but even the, there's some stuff happening at Google. I was actually at Google I/O this year. Um, because I love watching all these technologies develop and looking at how they're going to change the, the type of storytelling that I do, right? And just even watching the augmented reality stuff, um, not just the full VR headset, but even like Project Tango, I believe, is like, you know, where you're actually the thing on the screen, you're walking through the real world, but the thing that you're seeing on your screen is an augmented version of the real world. Um, so you're actually gaining that physical aspect without actually leaving the real space Which opens up a you, whole right? Which just wide opens a whole, a yeah, a whole for, world of opportunities yeah. for us to, to give players. I think one of the things that I was actually talking about virtual reality um, games with a friend the other day, and they were talking about one of the, the hurdles that we have to take is that you have to be in an environment where the the player feels safe, like completely safe, because you're basically turning off their senses to the world that they're actually in, right? So I have to know that when I sit down, I put on a headset, like somebody's not going to like jump out at me, <laughs> right, in the real world. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things. But if you're looking at augmented reality instead, if you're looking at things that are on the, you know, mobile devices, um, at that point, now my peripheral vision is still with me, but I can still feel immersed in this world that's on the right. screen. Right? Mm -hmm. so. And then Google obviously launched um, Google Cardboard, which for most of us was like the Trojan horse experience to get into um, trying to play with augmented reality without making the investment into the um, uh, Oculus developer's kit. Um, really was a smart play to, I think, I think at first people thought it was just Google trolling everybody else, but it turned out to be quite a brilliant <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> It turned out to be quite a brilliant play, which is the device that you have is powerful enough and has the same motion tracking. Um, put it inside the simple device, um, create interesting content. You've got this beautiful little um, AR device. So um, it's really opened up the eyes of a lot of producers to what uh, can be done with the technology. And I imagine that in your lab you're pushing that farther. I think, you know, that's a sort of classic Google story, right? It was a bunch of engineers in a Paris office and they were looking at Oculus and they said the processor in here isn't any different than it's in your phone. And they actually literally made one out of cardboard. Like it wasn't a huge corporate strategy with these guys in Paris. They made one, they showed it, they thought it was cool. They like, let's bring it to I.O. Um, and it's taken off because it's so accessible, right? It's, an, right. it's a chance right. to play around. And so we have a bunch of different parts of our world coming together where cardboard is one, Maps is one, like Maps is essentially a 3D model of the world. And so it already exists and you can play with it. And so we're looking at places where you can layer in the history. We did a, we did a project with a national mall in Washington DC around um, the Martin Luther King Jr. speech and the march and you can see unreleased photographs. You stand in that space, you see that layer there. We did a similar one with Abbey Road where you can go inside Abbey Road Studios and you click through and there's John Williams composing the Star Wars theme and you can play with the devices and so on. And so just thinking about, yes, reality is there and then what are the layers and can the digital experience, the mobile experience be better than the live experience, yeah. than the real yeah. experience? And I think that's coming in a lot of ways. What kind of skills are you as, as producers and, and directors looking for? Um, I imagine that's changed dramatically over the last 10 years or so where um, many, of you, many of you are now working closely with coders and developers and getting deeper into technology that you probably ever thought you'd be um, looking back in your background at, uh, I think it was, your, was it your background in dance, Athena? Oh, or theater. Stage, the yeah. Stage. <laughs> stage, yeah. <laughs> so, so you probably never imagined that one day you'd be sitting down next to a, uh, uh, a programmer trying to work out how things are going to move. No. Um, no, I, it's really interesting. I think, I think one of the things that is important, especially when I'm doing hiring um, nowadays, is finding people who are just open to that move of technology. Um, right? It used to be we'd, we'd go in and we'd be like, oh, well, you have to know C++. Like, that is the core of PC development. Um, if you don't know that, then we wouldn't know, you know what to do with you if you were a programmer. Um, nowadays, I think it's more of a, are you willing to learn, you know, multiple languages, right? If somebody has multiple languages on their 
um, resume and, and you talk to them about these new technologies and they get excited, then that's, that's definitely going to key me into you know, that developer versus another one who's just stuck on this one thing that they're really good at. Because the, the thing that we, with technology, you know, moving as fast as it is right now, right, all the developments that we're seeing right now, we have to just be open-minded to, to say, in five years, the platforms we're working on will look absolutely nothing like right. what we're doing right now, right? So we have to be prepared for that. So. Yeah, are you, are you comfortable with your skills becoming obsolete is a super interesting <laughs> right. question in an exactly. interview. Like, that's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's right. true. It's yeah. true. And I, you know, and I think, I, I think it's about being flexible. I personally, I mean, I, yeah, my background, my degree is in traditional, like, stage theater. Um, not even it film. changed a lot in a whole mess. Yeah, I didn't even do <laughs> film, right? Um, and I actually taught myself uh, computers when I decided I wanted to leave theater and get into games. I, I went out and bought my first computer. I taught myself how to put it together. Because um, really, when it comes down to it, um, we have to learn to not fear technology. Um, a lot of times, we can look at it from the outside. And, and as we become more of an older generation, right? we look at these things that are coming in, and it goes, oh, but this doesn't look anything like what I had when I was a kid. And that terrifies. It must be hard. But the truth, it's not. Like, I'm, I'm just cardboard, talking about cardboard itself, right? I handed, I came back from I.O., and I handed cardboard, you know, the little cardboard set to my three-year-old. She put it up to her head and just started walking around this museum. And now, every time she sees my phone, she wants me to, to bring out the thing and let her go to the museum again. Um, it took her no time at all to figure that out. And I think that uh, you know, the lesson to me in that is that the technology itself is not difficult. And actually, the more we develop the technology, we're developing it to be even simpler. So we shouldn't let our age in, uh, you know, scare us away from that technology, because we can always learn it. It's always learnable. Right? Yeah, maybe there's a point at which being really good at forgetting becomes a virtue. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> make it, make it I'll work become for more us. and more valuable yeah. as I get older. <laughs> Start over again. That's right. That's right. That's I don't right. remember what this is. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, Mike, this might be a loaded question, but you work inside of a, a traditional agency that's, that's obviously moving towards a uh, converged world. Um, but are films and episodic television commercials still the best way to tell stories? With, with mobile as an extension? Or do you, do you really see it heading the other way where it becomes the tail that wags the dog? Um, I mean, I don't think that best way is a way that I would look at I mean, it's we have more ways now, you know? Yeah. Like, and I, I think it's sort of what is the story you're trying to tell and what's the right way to tell that story. And, you know, we've got a lot of options at this point, you know? And even within, you know, what we'll consider traditional, I mean, the platforms that that content's being taken in on obviously is tremendously diverse. and so. Are we taking advantage of new capabilities even within what we previously thought of as a pretty static or passive experience? You know, I'm watching most of my TV through my Xbox at this point, so the odds are good I've got a controller pretty handy. Is, right. there, is there an opportunity there for me to point to something within the shot and say, how much did that thing cost, or where can I get this, or I'd like to buy that right now? You know, surface level stuff, but all of a sudden you have me as an active participant there and not just someone who's watching it without really changing a lot of the actual form of the medium itself you know, with on, on the narrative side. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think like, you know, like I said, we've got so much more to think about. I think it's become a lot more complicated with regards to what is the right way to tell this story and what is the, you know, what is the experience that we want people to have when thinking about you know, our message or our story, you know, and what do we want them to be feeling, but also what we want them to be doing. You know, before I think, you know, we never really thought of user experience as something outside of, you know, sort of the, the building of an interactive thing for the most part. But watching a TV commercial, there is an experience that's attached to that. And while it may be something that we easily take for granted because we watch a lot of TV and we know what it's like to sit still and see a commercial, that is a thing in itself. So how do we, how do we capitalize on that when we need to? How do we branch out from there when we want to? And, you know, how do we get away from that completely if it's really the wrong thing for our, for our story? Lauren, do you have anything to add to that coming from the television side? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we, like I said, that's our, that's our core content are those feature length films. But there are so many other things that we're thinking about, you know, because that is our 
kind of bread and butter, we then gravitate to those stories that are best told in that format. But you know, that said, when we're thinking about other things to be developed by us as kind of history producers, one of the things that we've been talking about lately is material culture. And if we were looking at objects and objects as a way to better understand American history, well, being able to see that object in 300 60 degrees would be incredible, you know what I mean? So to that end, I think we would be looking at, you know, at a minimum how those are shot, whether, you know, they're shot in 360 degrees. But what I love about something like Google Cardboard is that, you know, we don't really have the luxury in public television to act as much like a startup as we might want to. You know, we would love to be experimenting a whole lot more than we are, but we need to justify every dollar that we spend. And so we need to have our audience in mind. So, you know, five years ago when people were exper experimenting with virtual reality, would we even have considered it? No. But now when you think that, wow, you could have a classroom full of kids because they already have the phones, you know, and all they need to get now is the cardboard that you can actually see an audience that could experience all of this stuff, that opens up a whole other realm for us to be exploring. Like, okay, now how could we tell history, tell stories about history in a way that capitalizes on the availability of that technology and the access to that technology? So, you know, I do think that when we're not thinking about kind of the epic stories told in our films, when we think more about what are more kind of bite-sized consumable pieces right. of history that we might be interested in, in, in doing, we're open to very different formats and very different technology to tell that story. Very good. Does there okay. anyone want to add to that before we move on to maybe some questions and answers from the audience? Yeah, I just had, I just, sorry, I just had one good. thought there. I think, I, I think that um, we're, we're at a, a point where it's not technology that holds us back, it's imagination. And we're waiting for somebody with a big enough imagination to tell a story on mobile that blows us all away. And then we'll see, it'll seem so obvious when it's done, right? right? And we'll think, oh my god, OK, yes, now I see. We're just not there. Like the mobile <laughs> storytelling is interesting, and it's cool. And we're digesting other pieces. But no one has ingested it and then come out with a new thing yet. And I think it's coming. It's going to be very shortly. And we'll all just, it'll blow us all away. It'll change all of our behaviors. Oh, the rest of us will rush to imitate it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, one of you guys should make it. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. I was going to hop on to uh, one thing that was said about what do you want your audience to be doing. Um, this is actually, I was just down um, at UT talking to some game design students about mobile. And I talked about how important the UI is. And I think that actually, as all, all storytellers in all of our various mediums, right, the when determining where our medium needs to go, that's the number one question we need to ask ourselves. What do you actually want your audience to be doing? Um, that's one of the things we face when we look at a mobile product, right? And I ask my designers when they're talking about, um, you know, they, they talk about the gameplay and how the game works and the story. And my question always comes back, yes, but as, a cons as the player, what do you want me to physically be doing, right? Do you want me to be tapping? Do you want me to be sliding? And how would these actions um, make me feel that story deeper? Right, and so I think that's that's really the determination on like when we have a platform is that is the thing that I'm asking my audience to do helping to tell the story or is it detracting it mm -hmm. from it? Right, like if it, if the story is to sit back and really absorb this history lesson, right? Maybe I don't want to be like going like this the whole time. That's <laughs> probably a distraction. Um, but if if the intent is to get my you know heart rate up, then maybe maybe that is the good thing to do. Right. So. Um, maybe we can take some questions from the audience. We have a we have a microphone, so anybody that's interested, just raise your hand. Over here. Oh, I'll dive in. Um, so, <laughs> I think that theater is still the Oculus Rift in analog that we can we can <laughs> yeah. get to. So, I produced this summer. I moved here actually because of this event a year ago. I finally moved here to Massachusetts. Um, I produced the living history of Marie Curie. What if you could time travel and meet her in her lab? So we shot it this summer. It's a play. It's been around for 15 years. It's brilliant. People love it. 50,000 people have seen this play. But it's theater. Mm -hmm. You can't go anywhere. Yep. And you have to believe a suspension of disbelief, and then it breaks the fourth wall. So I experimented this summer, and we, we didn't get it, but we started, which is theater. With a live audience, we get it. Then we want to go back in and allow people to say, where do you want to go from there? Is it because of the connection to Polish heritage? Is it because of a love of physics? 
and we have all this like uh, carefully created material. So I use it as a lab experiment. Mm -hmm. So I still think theater is really relevant. Yeah. I think theater is an overlooked thing because you are actually immersed in there. And that's one thing I'm really curious about too is teaching so what I call narrative science. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, um, multiple perspectives, storytelling and history, because people are learning about something because of why, why are you there? You're not watching a documentary for the same reasons. Right, right. And so what I'm trying to work on now, and that was my question, is how do you find your audience, you know, kind of metrics and demographics? In the past, it's a one direction out. It's like I'm advertising something, whether you want it or not, we can't tell. You can tell now, you can ask. Mm -hmm. And are we going to be moving to a place, my dream is to move to a place where you can slightly customize the user experience. So that, for example, if you're watching, in the case of the living history of Marie Curie, if you want to learn more about a topic, it can be compiled so at the end of it, your user extension comes back to things that connect to you. Mm -hmm. And so are there things that are coming from that perspective to kind of customize it beyond just giving these story worlds, but letting, as, as Sondheim says, that the audience is the final collaborator? How are we making sure that the audience can fully collaborate in the mobile side of things? And thanks for letting me share. And Sorry. <laughs> I know uh, we have uh, analytics is a major part of um, our move into this space. Um, so we're constantly taking in and determining who is that audience that we're going for. Um, most of the time when we decide on a game, we'll um, kind of determine what that audience is that we're trying to grab, and then we'll try to make that game towards that audience. Um, we also do a lot of A-B testing. Um, to kind of figure out like between two choices what's really grabbing the audience that we're going for um, behavior wise. So that's a lot of ours is about constantly, constantly taking those metrics. And then also making sure that you're making like when you get, you know, from the get go, you're kind of defining for yourself, this is the type of game I want to make because this is the type of audience that I'm creating this moment for, right? Um, and then, you know, you adjust as you know, using that analytics as they're playing it, you adjust to make sure that you're still hitting in um, to that space. And game, game companies, I think, have been traditionally very good at creating those modes of play where if I'm the dad uh, uh, Madden player that just wants to get in and get out, I don't yeah. want to have to worry about customizing my team or doing trades right. or joining fantasy leagues. Um, that's all there for, for my kids to humiliate me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> make sure that, that there's multiple levels of of, uh, of experience. Yeah. I think also, I mean, you, you can't sort of overlook how much information we generally know about people when they're interact. Like, the amount of real time data that you can collect from somebody with regards to, like, where are they? What time is it there? What's the weather like? You know, when you sort of open the doors to customizing experience that includes things like what's happening outdoors where I am right now, um, you know, you can sort of tailor fit to a pretty sometimes frightening degree with regards to how much you can make it feel like what I'm experiencing is very, very relevant to where I am right now. And a lot of that stuff that's happening behind the scenes without us, you know, as users on that front really doing anything aside from just looking at what it is we're looking at anyway. I mean, I think for us, we really have to hold the line on a lot of that. You know, we're historical documentary, you know what I mean? So to some extent, we're not going to tailor the story based on what the audience really wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> that's a slippery slope. But I think what we need to be aware of are those metrics of where people are consuming our content, how people are consuming our content, and making sure that it is available to them where they want to consume it, when they want to consume it. You know, we can't just look at, Nielsen ratings anymore. You know, they were unreliable to begin with. And, you know, even now they become even more so. We have to be collecting that data from so many different places to figure out how our content is actually being consumed. And, you know, things we, we can pay attention to are length of films. You know, we, we tried to make the film the appropriate length for the story. But if we realize absolutely no one would have tuned in if this were <laughs> seven hours, we have to pay attention to that because we want people to consume our content. You know, so, it, but I think as far as what the content is itself, like I said, that's where we hold kind of a stronger line when it comes to documentary. You know, for whatever it's worth, too, just on the VR front. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Just like when we talk about theater, you know, as we get more and more into feeling, feeling out what's doable with, like, with regards to narrative VR and looking at an experience that tells a story in a way that we're accustomed to watching, like movies, you, know, you start to see that a lot of the conventions we're used to, like 
like cuts and stuff like that don't really work. And so a lot of the more successful, at least short for, uh, you know, narrative stuff for VR, it's very much like theater. It really is, you know, about finding how do you focus people's attention in a place wherein, you know, you're giving them a sense of, you know, presence in a room or, you know, theater, whatever that, you know, sort of environment might be, but you don't want people always looking for where the action is because they're going to miss something. And so it, it is a lot like, you know, a, you know, pretty traditional stage play in a lot of cases just to ensure that, you know, the story is being viewed in the right place without sacrificing, you know, that surround environment. So it's, we see a lot of parallels between the two and I'll get into that sort of thing. Um, there's a question up here. Hi. So my question is sort of two parts. Um, I thought it was fascinating that you guys talked a lot about um, producers working alongside programmers and coders and being in sort of a tradi uh, traditional producer environment for so long. I'm curious, uh, first, how you create an environment, a work environment, where more traditional producers can work alongside with coders and, you know, sort of the techie folks and not be afraid of that, but also have that be a successful work environment. And then the other part of my question is, as a producer, how can, you know, what qualities could I sort of adopt to be able to work better with folks that are doing the more technical side of things? I think you mentioned, you know, Athena, you mentioned not being afraid of mm -hmm. technology, but is there something else that, as a producer, you know, those qualities I could adopt, I guess? I think, I think for one, um, I mean, they, I, this is actually, I came from, you know, more of a design and theater background, so I'm not super technical. Um, but I think one thing that helps me a lot in being able to connect with my more technical staff is that um, I, I do try to get myself a surface level, right? So I've gone in and taken, ba you know, one basic scripting program class. I took, I took programming back in high school, but it was like Pascal and nobody uses that anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I at least have some understanding, right, a very rudimentary. I could never actually get into my game and code anything. Nobody would want that. Um, but I at least have a general idea of the theory of the practice. Um, I also try to keep myself abreast of what the technologies are that are coming out. And so that even if I'm not hands-on ever touching that technology myself, I at least can talk to my more technical staff on a level at which I have some basic understanding of what it is that they're doing every day and the challenges that they might run into. Um, so I would, I would definitely recommend that, right? Just taking some basic courses on understanding the technologies that you might be moving into. Um, and then otherwise, I, I'm, I'm very like humble producer when it comes to my staff, my management style. Um, I am very honest and upfront with the fact that they know far more than me about what's going on in the back end of that stuff and kind of trying to step out of their way and make sure that they have, you know, they have the needs that, that help their specific field, right? So it might be that they need more quiet than the more creative staff does, right? Or that kind of thing and just making sure that, that I'm taking the care of them as a manager for their needs specifically, um, just like I would any of the rest of my staff. I guess I would just say make work. It's never been easier, it's never been cheaper, there have never been more resources, there are never more people who want to make things, do things. Your neighbor's kid, the guy at the hardware store, like they all have projects that would <laughs> immensely benefit from your experience and you could learn immediately, but you learn things by doing you would never learn from any course, I think. Yeah. And I would definitely echo the sentiment of, you know, trusting the expertise of your teams, you know, like the stuff that we're working on, it gets very complicated and there's no reason why you should ever be expected to be an expert in all of the facets of that. But the odds are really good that if you've got a solid team, they're really good at that and that's what they're there for and you should let them do that. I think you have time for one more question. Uh, right there. You in the hat. <laughs> I have a question about the accelerating pace of narrative which seems to be technology driven. I've been working in films for about the last year. I went to a play, a contemporary play, uh, about a month ago, and I sat there thinking, these people talk so much, and they, they talk for a long time, and there's no space in this for anything else. And I thought about that later, and I thought, I feel like for television in particular, the pace is now faster than life. And my question really is, where is this headed? Are we, have, are we 
reached the limit of narrative speed or is there some barrier we're going to go beyond and where we'll finish the film before it begins <laughs> something like that so i'll bring in an odd perspective here from the brain science side some folks some wonkier folks in our org we're doing some research about how rapidly we're able to visually take in information uh, and it turns out that we are a, a very, very, very long distance from that barrier. We are able to visually take in information at a phenomenally faster rate than we do now. Speech is a different thing, and I'm actually curious about the gap between speaking and our ability to comprehend orally versus visually, but at least on the visual side, we got a, we got a long way to go. And so we, that's one of the reasons that we dug into um, shot length and overall length, right? We don't want it to be quicker, we want more. We want, I want another season of Mad Men and Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones, and I can't believe I have to wait for it. I, I want seven, eight, nine hours of content, but the paces within them are faster. The cutting is much faster. I'd be curious about what era the play you were, went to watch was written in. Um, it was. It was a contemporary writer. Interesting. Oh, yeah. That's interesting because I think I think the speed of plays and the amount of dialogue in them has actually changed um, depending on what you know decade or century it was written in because it, it had to do with what medium they were putting it in, right? Um, what type of stage? I actually spent several years uh, working with Shakespeare troupe in Austin. Um, that's where my most recent like actual stage directing was from. And I actually surprise people a lot of times with how quick my Shakespeare plays are. And that's because the, the language, if you actually like dig into it, it's very quick. And actually there's stuff happening all the time because it was made for like these three level audiences. Some people are paying attention, some people aren't. It's like a football game, right? It was like you know the football sporting event of the, of the time period. And so it actually was built to catch people's attention at this really rapid speed. Um, but I think that at certain times, um, plays have not been that. They've been more sit back and just kind of you know, zone out. Um, so I think it really has to do with what specific, you know, once again, it's the story that you're trying to tell. And um, you know, I've actually found that there's a lot of silence even in some of the shows like the, the, that we watch on TV nowadays. Because um, I used to be able to like just sew and not necessarily pay attention. I could just sit there with my hands and hear things. Um, now I find I can't do that because there's stuff happening on the TV that had to do with the story that I'm totally going to miss. <laughs> right? um, so the silent moments min you know, matter too. Right. And I think from our standpoint in documentary, a lot of times it is topic driven. You know, we would have everything from you know two films that pop to mind we are coming out with a film soon about bonnie and clyde and that film has a faster pace to it you know that film is one hour the story lends itself very well to kind of a quicker pace a film that we put out a few years ago on the amish is a much more meditative film both everything from um not just i mean topic wise obviously that that would make sense but also visually you know there are a lot of very long shots just looking across fields, just looking across, and that set the pace, and it kind of, it sets the pace for the viewer as well. You know, when you're sitting there, all of a sudden you realize you kind of settle down. You settle into the pace that's being set by the, by what's coming at you, and so I think, you know, to your point, Ben, our ability to respond to that is kind of miraculous because you do find yourself, it's that same way that you find yourself breathing more calmly when everyone around you is calm and picking up the pace when everyone else is, that I think we respond to that similarly when we're watching media and I think our topics drive that pace as well when we're producing. I think that's it. I, I uh, want to thank all the panelists for um, doing such a great job here. The films I did earlier in my career, the, the people who were financing it were also involved in the day-to-day. -day. Okay. And so there was a lot more care about the final product. I mean, if you said, you know, I really don't think we can shoot this in 25 days, they would find a way to either raise more money or they would defer their producing
lengthy, you know, there was more heart in it, yeah. I felt like, yeah. to, to make a good movie.